Welcome to this uh, introduction to IPv6, uh, transition to IPv6 in the, for service providers. So, um, actually, this is a little bit about my experience. I have been uh, IPv6 for about 15 years and in about 20 years in Cisco and TCP IP. You can find me on the internet and I will be very happy to answer to your questions if you need anything about uh, uh, routing and switching or IPv6 in general. So I would like to first introduce the um, generations of tools that we have seen for transitioning to IPv6. So the first generation was the uh, uh, when IPv6 was introduced in '96. So the dual stack and the uh, static tunnels were the first tools which were introduced to permit an experimental backbone, the six bone, to be created. And at the same time, um, NAT and private addresses permitted to extend the life of IPv4 for 20 more years. But it also broke uh, a few things about the internet, like the peer-to-peer -peer model, which was broken by NAT. So IPv6, uh, one of the goals of IPv6 is to get rid of NAT, and which is a good thing. The uh, second generations of tools were the first tools which permitted uh, for service providers to deploy IPv6 services. So the first tools were for MPLS, uh, backbone service providers. So basically at the end of the 90s, most service providers were deploying uh, MPLS backbone. And it was quite difficult to tell them that actually they would need to uh, start an IPv6 uh, a backbone instead. So Cisco started to develop 6PE to permit an immediate uh, deployment of IPv6 over MPLS uh, IPv4 backbone. Later came 6RD, which permitted to develop an IPv6 service over IPv4 backbone. And at the same time, we have seen um, uh, idea to use the IPv4 address, public addresses with more uh, efficiency and the idea was to use one more time NAT and another level, another stage of NAT to, uh, to share IPv4 addresses among customers. Um, and also at the same time, we have seen protocols to translate between IPv4 and IPv6 with the first uh, tool, which was NatPT, which is now deprecated because it was doing too much things, as we are going to see later. The third generation actually was started at the same time than the second generation, but actually, uh, the goal is to get rid of uh, carrier-grade NATs because service providers don't like much the idea of running NATs in the backbone, stateful NATs. Uh, stateful protocols in a backbone are never um, very... Uh, um, something the service provider wants to see because um, you must do a very um, careful capacity planning to make sure you will um, plan enough resource to to do to uh, manage the translation. If you don't, you will have problems. So uh, architecture, stateless architectures are being studies like uh, A plus B architecture, which is providing the same benefits than carrier grade NAT, but without um, having to run a stateful NAT in the backbone. And this is something which is currently being studied and very interesting for the service providers. So if we look at the, uh, the transition uh, deployment for service providers, so the six bone was not really for service providers, it was a test bed 
for testing uh, IPv6. It was actually built up with static tunnels over uh, IPv4 uh, backbone and it was not really scalable for service providers. So service providers started to develop IPv6 service services with uh, 6PE and 6VPE um, uh, over MPLS backbones. And then later, uh, French service providers invented 6RD, which also permitted to deploy IPv6 service over an IPv4 backbone without MPLS. And once a service provider has uh, finished this transition and is running a native um, IPv6 backbone, he may still need to uh, support IPv4 customers. So solutions for that um, is to run DS Lite with DS Lite, we will see that we can support IPv4 customer, and we we we, we support these customers uh, as a service providers running an IPv6 backbone, and also a solution which is needed for the customers who have migrated to IPv6 completely and still needs to access IPv4 content then NAT64 is going to translate IPv6 to IPv4 and will permit uh, the customers to access some uh, IPv4 content uh, from an IPv6-only network. Uh, there are some other uh, tested uh, protocols, as uh, I have already uh, uh, explained, uh, like the third generation's protocols, but these are for the moment uh, mostly tested. So the first uh, tools which were used for um, helping the transition was network address translation protocols and NAT44 and IPv4 private addresses in the 90s was the very first example. Some people think that NAT is an IP feature which was there since day one for IPv4, but actually NAT was only a workaround to, um, to deal with address depletion, but uh, NAT44 uh, extended the life of IPv4 for more 20 for 20 more years, but it also has broken many uh, features of uh, the internet. And IPv6, one of the goal of IPv6 is to get rid of NAT uh, to get these features back. Um, IPv6 to IPv4 translation were also proposed till since 2000 with a protocol called NATPT, which was doing so much that it was not very scalable. It was doing NAT64, NAT46, uh, address uh, application layer gateway for DNS, FTP, and everything. So it was really the performance were ugly, and uh, it is now deprecated and replaced by something which is doing less, uh, which is NAT64 and DNS64, and which only permits uh, for IPv6 only customers to access IPv4 content. Uh, we also see uh, service providers uh, doing a lot of tests and in some cases implementing carrier-grade NAT solutions which actually is, uh, the principle is to run NAT in the service provider backbone so we can share a public IPv4 address among multiple customers and save addresses. So again, the first tool uh, which was provided was were uh, dual stack and static tunneling uh, in 96. It has permitted the six bone to be uh, built, and it was uh, a test bed to, to, to test many applications, many protocols. But it was not something uh, 
for service providers to uh, pro to 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 provide a service for customers. Um, first uh, attempts to run something more scalable were automatic tunnels with six to four. So six to four solves two solution provides two solu solution. One solution provided by six to four is to automatically uh, provide you with an IPv6 prefix because there is a reserved block which is a block starting from 2002 uh, which is a block reserved for 624 addresses and then the 32 bits which are following are the uh, it is actually the 32 bits of your IPv4 public uh, address on the internet so this is a, a unique address, and this way your IPv6 uh, slash 48 prefix is also unique, and it can be subnetted. You have 16 bit for, subnet for subnetting. And so uh, two problems solved. One problem is that you don't need to configure the destination IPv4 address of the tunnel because the, uh, the destination IPv4 address is derived from the IPv6 uh, address. And also, you don't need to request an address because an IPv6 address is automatically provided uh, from this block reserved. So if you see here the example, 2002 is 2002, C0 is 192, 46 is 70, and 1 is 1. So this is a slash 48 prefix, which is used for the site on the left, on the right-hand side. And same principle for the left-hand side, with 192 C0, 44 is 68, and 1 is 1. And so again, this slash 48 prefix can be subnetted in many prefixes, in many uh, subnetted, subnets. Um, and last thing about 624 is that to access the IPv6 internet, uh, public 624 relay are provided uh, to access the uh, IPv6 internet. But as this is a, um, a fixed um, prefix 2002, the public relay are uh, not controlled by the customer and it cannot be used again by a service provider. So a service provider came up with the idea to customize this prefix uh, to make it possible uh, to deploy a service um, because it was no longer a 2002 prefix but a prefix that can be customized for each service provider. So you still need a 6RD uh, CPE and you need a 6RD uh, B, BR uh, border relay which is going to be your uh, gateway to the IPv6 internet. So basically the 6RD CPE is configured with the address of the border relay and when it detects that the destination is not local it forwards the packet to the border relay for the border relay to uh, uh, switch the traffic out to the IPv6 internet. So again same principle than 624 difference is the prefix no longer 2002, but a prefix customized uh, for the uh, service provider. And then the IPv4 uh, public address of the customer, which is uh, following. And then the interface ID for each machine inside your, uh, your network. And this is how your 6RD addresses is um, is built 
Uh, again, it is following exactly the same principle as 6 to 4, with the difference that the prefix is no longer 2002 at the beginning, but a prefix which can be customized for each service provider, and so the service provider can control the relay and the return path. So when destination is local, uh, the, the IPv6 uh, packet is encapsulated in IPv4, and the uh, IPv4 destination address is the, the, the local destination address. If the uh, IPv6 uh, destination is not belonging to the, uh, the same domain, then it, it must be uh, forwarded by the border relay. So in this case, the residential gateway, the CPE, is configured with the uh, border relay uh, address, and instead of encapsulating the traffic directly to the neighbor, it forwards it to the border relay uh, to get sent to the outside, to the IPv6 internet. So why this is a such interesting solution? The cost, because you need only one tunnel and not uh, a tunnel for each customer. So it is very cost effective and many, many service providers are, uh, the latest example I had was Yahoo, who chose 6RD to uh, provide um, a service using an IPv4 backbone. For the customers, service providers with MPLS, there is no choice. It is 6PE or 6VPE. And again, the beauty is that you do not need to change the backbone. You just need to add the 6PE at the edge, and you will have immediately uh, provided an IPv6 service um, to your customer. Once the service providers have completed its migration to IPv6, it may still need to support IPv4 customers. So how can we do this? One solution is to use DS Lite. DS Lite is a solution where uh, we actually uh, tunnel the, the traffic um, from the customer to the service provider so it is encapsulated within IPv6, and when it, it arrives at the service provider, it is decapsulated, and the uh, private address is translated to a public address before it is sent to the uh, IPv4 internet. And again, because NAT is performed by the service provider, uh, the same IPv4 public address can be shared by many customers, so which is a good solution. What to do now for customers who have completely uh, migrated to uh, a full IPv6 uh, a solution, uh, and these customers still need to access IPv4 content. So the solution today is NAT64 DNS64. Uh, as la latest example I have was a mobile phone operator who uh, pro is providing IPv6 service only, and they plan to use NAT64 because more and more uh, uh, content is now uh, IPv6 uh, ritual, and so they, 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 they think that uh, there will, there will be, uh, there will not, there, there will not need too much translation and uh, NAT64 will not be so much solicited because most of the traffic will be IPv6 native. So how NAT64 is working, uh, basically, um, the principle is quite simple. Uh, by your position to NAT PT from the beginning, uh, the DNS64 and NAT64 are in two separate boxes. 
So basically, an IPv6 only client is requesting an IPv6 address for uh, the name h2example.com. The DNS64 is looking for an IPv6 address, but if it cannot find an IPv6 address, it will get an IPv4, but it will translate to IPv6 using the, the well-known prefix 64FF9B, and then the IPv4 address coded in IPv in hexadecimal, like C0 for 192, 242, and 0141. Then once the address is uh, loaded, we can send a TCP SYN to the destination. The packet is routed using normal IPv6 routing to the NAT64 box, uh, which has the prefix 64FF9B. Um, by the way, something about uh, NAT64, NAT64 is that NAT64 comes in two flavor. It can be stateless or stateful. In stateless, it is a one-to-one -one, uh, translation. One IPv4 address for one IPv6 address. With the stateful version, it is possible to save IPv4 address and uh, use the same IPv4 address for many IPv6. Uh, another protocol to save IPv4 address is double NAT or NAT444. The idea is that uh, the CPE is no longer translating a private address to a public address, but a private to a private, and then it is only at the service provider that the private address is translated to a public address. So doing this, it becomes possible to share um, a public address among multiple customers, which was not possible uh, before. So this looks nice, but it is not without problems. Uh, well, the first one is a scalability problem, scalability issue. How many translations uh, the LSN uh, should be managed, should be able to manage. So how can we size uh, the LSN box to make sure it will have enough uh, memory, enough CPU to manage all the translation? Difficult. So we can set a limit, but it means that when the limit is reached, there is no more service, no more access to uh, the uh, internet. Also, a problem is that it is a single point of failure. So if the NS LSN box is uh, reloading, it is all the clients, all the customers, which are going to uh, reload, will need to restart their application to uh, log in again. Another problem is a network design issue. Uh, we translate private to private. So what happens if the customer is using the same private address than the address which is used between the service provider and the customer? So we, we, we may have a problem. If we have a duplicated address, we know that IPv4 is not working very well. Uh, another possible problem, uh, another possible problem with this is if we have two customers behind uh, the same uh, LSN box, um, if the, uh, the two customers are behind the same uh, NAT box, the packet will come back with a source address which is going to be a uh, a private address. And we know that the firewall don't like it very much. Uh, a firewall which is seeing a packet coming back from the internet with a private address 
usually it is filtering uh, this uh, packet out, it is dropping the packets. So which means that we, we would need to um, translate all traffic and including the local traffic which is uh, putting uh, which is going to load the LSN box uh, very much. So that's a uh, summary of the problems that we have with double NAT. So uh, scalability and single point of failures, but also uh, um, network design like overlapping address or uh, source address being a private address, which for a firewall can be a problem. Another solution to support uh, customers is DS Lite. Again, DS Lite is, can be used if the link between the service provider and the customer is running IPv6. So in this case, a, the uh, CPE of the customer is not do running NAT anymore. The traffic is tunneled to the service provider, and it is only as a service provider that um, the, uh, the, the IP packet, is, the, the address is translated to a public address. Another solution uh, is 4RD. 4RD is also about encapsulating IPv4 in IPv6, but with 4RD, there is no assumption about a, the, the NAT uh, running either at the CPE, either uh, in the service provider backbone. So if there is no assumption like this. So if we want, we can still uh, run NAT at the CPE as we were doing, for instance, with uh, other protocols before. Um, the last generation, as I was uh, stating at the beginning, uh, service providers are not very happy running uh, NAT in the backbone because, again, it has scalability issues. It is a single point of failures. Um, it is a lot of problems for uh, to manage for service providers, and uh, it is also breaking many things. Uh, for instance, you cannot run a, a server at home anymore. You know, when you are running NAT, for instance, simple NAT, it's possible to configure a static translation on your CPE, and then you can run a, a server at home. This is something we can do with simple NAT. With double NAT, it's no longer possible. And there are many problems like this. Um, double NAT is not something without any uh, problems. So it can be a solution in some very well-defined, very well-controlled environments, but it cannot be a solution for everything. So A plus P is a, a nice solution. Uh, actually, A plus P provides the same benefit that carrier grade NAT, which means that A plus P um, actually uh, permit to share a public address um, among multiple customers using the source port uh, to multiplex the address, which means that each um, customer will not have the full range of source ports available. Each customer will only have a range of ports which is which will be um, uh, for each site. So if the hosts are running A plus P, it is no problem. Each host knows that it only have has a, a, a given range of ports and cannot use uh, all the possible uh, source ports. If the hosts are not updated, 
It means that we need to have uh, a router at the edge which is going to do some kind of translation to make sure that the packets which are going out of the uh, site are not going to use ports which are not allocated to this site. So this is a translation, but it is not uh, as heavy, as um, complex as NATS. It is a very simple translation. So this is one function of uh, A plus P. Another function, and this function can be in the first uh, proposal, it is run by DV protocol, which is a stateless 4x4 protocol. DV uh, is able to do this to share a public IP v4 uh, address among multiple sites using a range of ports for each site. The other functionality which is needed by uh, the A plus P uh, border router is to do the uh, encapsulation of IPv4 in IPv6, uh, for instance. And this can be performed by the 4RD protocol. And this is what has been proposed again in the first proposal. Uh, the last function is signaling. Signaling is to avoid the manual provisioning of the ports available for each site. So basically, um, we said that each site has only a range of ports uh, allocated, and uh, this range of ports can be manually provisioned, manually configured, or if we have a signaling protocol, it can be automatic. And if it is automatic, it is as convenient as stateful NATs because it does not require any uh, manual provisioning from anyone. Uh, in the first pro proposal, there is no uh, signaling ready. So the first proposal is only uh, manual uh, static provisioning. So DV uh, is the base of the first A plus P implementation. I recommend you take a look at this test, uh, which has been um, uh, running and which has permitted to, uh, to test that DV was a good solution for a service provider um, where multiple sites were, each site were using a range of ports and not the full uh, range of all ports for all the sites. So that's a very interesting test and I recommend you take a look at this. You will see that it is really an alternate um, uh, choice to uh, carrier grade NAT and large scale NAT which can bring a lot of benefits. I, uh, I did not have time to explain all the benefits but there are many, many, many benefits running uh, a stateless uh, protocol and A plus B. So thank you very much for attending. Um, if you need more detail, please uh, join me on my blog on fastlaneus.com and uh, I, I am giving much more detail about A plus B, about uh, all these transition tools, and I will be very happy to answer your question if you drop me an email. Thank you very much and bye.